G'day my friends, Marty Wee here from Marty's Garden. Look, uh, today this live show is about scaling up your worm farming space, whether you should be doing that, just turn this sound effect down a little bit. Getting used to using the software here, if you haven't watched last night's show, you would know that we were able to purchase the software from Ecamm Live to really start stepping up the live shows and video productions. And here we are, look at this beautiful little screen that we've got, it's because of you guys that have helped me through the Buy Me A Coffee website, doing your super chats through these lives, and also purchasing the ebook over at the Buy Me A Coffee webpage that I've got. There's a link uh, in the description if you wanna go check that out at any time. So, scaling up worm farms, now, it's something that a lot of people don't do. And they may find that once they start getting really good at worm farming and they're getting expansion of worms, once you get so many in a, once in a small worm farm, they won't expand numbers anymore. The big mature ones will try to escape and move out to allow the smaller ones the food production because they sort of want to migrate. That's why we always talk about the migration methods uh, in worm farms. So, Scaling up can be a really good idea if you're enjoying the process and you're finding that you're just starting to getting it right. Now, if you're still struggling with it, maybe go through the rest of my videos, uh, check them out and um, find some new ways. Find some, uh, sorry, I just had the chat box come up there. Yeah, and find, look at other ways to start worm farming and things. But yeah, if you're struggling, you maybe check out my videos on here or check out my uh, worm farming ebook over at the Buy Me a Coffee webpage, and that'll help you get started and rolling things along quite quickly. Because you'd be surprised, within about three months, you can start scaling up uh, quite quickly. Because in certain times of the year, they breed so fast. So oh, I just got to ban these people coming in here with these chats. I don't know why this, these guys come up with the bots. But anyway, uh, yeah. So let's get the roll, rolling on here with the live shows. Excuse any sort of like, it's. I'm still getting used to this software. So uh, things aren't gonna be too perfect just yet, but the shows will get better. And Green Man's Garden, yeah. <laughs> big up, Marty, mate. Hi, worm lovers, yeah. So we're gonna be producing content on worm farming here as well. and And gardening and then I'll be occasionally going out and shooting little documentaries. You're going to see the documentary tomorrow about uh, the chicken farmer guy that um, he sort of scaled things up himself and made this amazing product. He's got this beautiful farm and yeah that's out tomorrow at 9am so occasionally I will be out shooting those and producing live shows and little videos like this to help you guys uh, stay educated. Now, just let me know that you can uh, hear me quite well if I'm coming in good. Everything looks pretty good uh, on my end, so I'm happy about that. And today uh, we're talking about uh, scaling up worm farms. Now we've got four people watching and already three thumbs up, so thank you very much for the thumbs up already, guys. And as you know, I, you're probably going, hey, Marty's out here, he's producing a lot of content at the moment. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. I just got my little drink here, keep me hydrated along the way, and just working on my stereo, on my microphone and different things here, the effects and stuff, to make sure I'm not clipping, the sounds good, and everything's working well. So, talking about scaling up our worm farm, so let's look at this, right? So, we're getting our worm farms right, we're actually getting good production, we're getting castings out of them, we're getting liquid out of them. And generally after the first three months, right, we've got our first tray, we put our second tray on top if we've got a vertical worm farm, and then they migrate up into that. We grab the bottom part of the worm farm uh, where all the castings are, and once they've migrated through, grab our worms, and then what we do is um, we start stacking on top of each other each time, each time, each time. But then you'll find what happen is eventually you'll just be getting so many that they won't breed anymore. Once the numbers are full and that worm farm's full, you can't really expand out. Now you may not want to expand out, you might be just totally happy with what you got and give some away to a neighbor, put some out in the garden. Generally they won't survive in the garden unless you've got like an underground permaculture worm farm. 
Um, and then you've got to have the right setup for it. Now I do have a video for that. It's called, uh, I think it's called Underground Permaculture Worm Farm is the actual name of the video. So check that out uh, on the channel. You can put them around your garden. And also I think uh, there's a video up about it in the members area as well, which helps you uh, get a better understanding about it. So that is another way that you can scale out and use them in your garden. And uh, yeah, I do that and I find it's a quite an easy way to do it. But another way to do it is what we're looking at here is a big bathtub worm farm or some type of big vat, a big tub. You know, you can get these old steel laundry tubs and things lying around, old aluminium ones. Whatever you can find that's got a drainage hole in the bottom, they work really good. You can find a nice shady spot for it. You can easily scale up with that and you probably never need to go much bigger than that. And what happens then, this becomes your major, it's like your soil engine, right? To produce all the good microbes and bacteria and all the good nutrients for your plants. And you can see down here, uh, there's a, the bucket down below collecting uh, all the juice as it's running through. And I highly suggest that you keep that juice really oxygenated and backfill it with some good rain water, some good pure, pure water and just shake it up and then throw it onto your plants. Turn it over as much as possible, don't let it go uh, too stagnant. So the bathtub worm farm is really cool. It is really cool. And I've had one myself in the past and I found that it worked great in a shaded environment and it was built pretty much how we see this one here. So we're just gonna drag across uh, a few people that are dropping in some comments here. And they said here the sounds perfect, so that's that's wonderful. And uh, thank you very much, Green Man, for letting me know. Main Mang, hello Marty, good day, <laughs> Main Mang. Thanks for coming. And Main, Mang. I'm thinking of getting a green wheelie bin with a tap at the bottom. Will it survive in a garage? Very hot in Western Australia. Yeah, it'll survive in a garage if you don't have too many fluctuating temperatures. Um, that's probably the biggest problem with worm farms. But you'll find that actually they work pretty well if you drill some holes in the top and around the top of the lid as well to allow circulation of, of airflow. Um, and they get these, um, you can look at them online and things and different people are selling them. They have this big vat that you get, it's like a grid that the plumbers use. You can go it in the plumber section and you sort of put it on there and that allows a lot of the airflow for down the bottom. So um, yeah, if you've got the option to get a uh, cheaper, a secondhand wheelie bin, maybe a good way to go. So what we're doing is we're looking at this worm farm here, this uh, bathtub worm farm, this is just one way to scale up. You know, there are plenty of other ways and we can talk about that further on uh, in the video for sure. But the bathtub worm farm is quite interesting because it has a lot of surface area, see? So we've got basically one, one worm farm and we're not really creating tiers or anything for them to climb up and migrate. They migrate in a different way. But what we'll talk about first is how to build one of these and uh, put it together so you get the best uh, results if you decide to scale up in this type of way. Now remember, you can do this in so many different ways. All you need is a, some type of housing and a lot of surface area to do something similar to a bathtub worm farm. Now if you've got any questions along the way, happy to answer them, we'll stop and move through and just we're just trying to stay on topic and if you've got any other questions regarding something else more towards the end of the video we'll do that there so as you can see here we've got our bathtub right we've got our collection down below we've got um on, on some type of poles or bricks or something like that and it's leaning slightly so the water will drip out now what we want to do is, um, the good thing about the bigger worm farms is because they don't uh, heat up and cool down as much as quickly because we've got more volume in them. And the old bathtubs are ceramic and they keep really, they keep cool, they hold their temperature much better. And so they're not fluctuating as much. And this is much, this is really good for long-term production of your worms. Now, what we're doing is, I'll show you from the top to bottom, on uh, the best way and if I there's a couple of things I disagree with on this in this worm farm where I think they could make it a little bit better and uh, we'll talk about that so you can see here they've got some type of grid over the top now this could be anything it could be 
uh, you know, they, some people put tin or whatever. I recommend you don't do that because, or corrugated iron, because you're not gonna let the rain in, right, when it's raining. You wanna capture that really highly oxygenated rain full of nitrogen and minerals falling into your worm farm. They just love that, right? And so you're better off having some type of, I'll just get this thing here, it's moving, some type of blanket. I recommend you've got some old shade cloth and you keep it nice and tight. That's the best way to go. Uh, or some type of blanket that allows the water uh, to get through. We want to try and keep it as dark as possible. Now, you can see here, I don't know what this line is here coming across here. We'll just have a look. Oh, it says wet towel, right? So that's not a bad idea to have a wet towel over the top in uh, the very, in a lot of heat. But what we want to do is talk about having as much oxygen flow as possible. And generally, if you've got a bit of a gap between the top part where you'd have your shake cloth, I would have the wet towel, a towel over the top that stays wet, and then a gap here. Um, so we've got airflow sort of in between uh, the two sections and a little bit of distance. So if the worms climb up a bit, they might fall back down. They'll climb because they all climb around everywhere. You've seen it all happen before, right? Uh, different times of year, different types of get um, rainstorms and things. They freak out and think they're going to drown. So they start climbing out. Many different reasons. So, but you don't really worry about losing worms in this type of worm farm because they're so big. It's so productive and you will lose a few uh, here and there. And it's just how it happens with worm farming. Some like to migrate. Right, so, and then we've got sort of our, um, our veggie scraps, our kitchen scraps along the top here. Now, when you first start your worm farm, it's not a bad idea um, to put the food right across the top at the start, but I think it's a bad habit to, to start off with. You're better off sort of like using a really good bedding, a really good compost bedding at first, um, and then having sort of some newspaper and cardboard up this up one end. And down this end, you have your feeding station, right? And so you're feeding everything at this end here. And what's happening is the worms are coming through and they're feeding predominantly at one end. They will move all around the farm because they're moving through the bedding and different things. They're feeding on different stuff. But predominantly, you've got them down one end feeding. And so the reason we're doing that is because we want to harvest from one end and then change and harvest from the other end and keep our worm farm rolling because they're not migrating. We're migrating them from one end. Uh, how am I going to do this? I can't do this on the screen. So one end to the other sort of thing and then we can harvest uh, quite easily so that's what i highly recommend and then what you do is this area here that's got all your scraps and everything over you cover that with some type of carbon some type you know like um leaves um maybe some straw maybe ripped up newspaper all that type of stuff and cover over that area so every time you're feeding you're putting it underneath the carbon so you're pulling the the blanket back if you've got a towel there feeding under the carbon and then into that zone here right and so you're really only doing the back sort of third and then it thins out towards the end towards the halfway mark and you feed it for quite a long time until you feel it's sort of nearly done then what you do is you stop feeding and you start feeding at the other end. And then they will slowly move up from there. This is all dissipated and all going. They're moving up to the other end and when you see them, they're all up here and they're really feeding hard. Then you start harvesting out of this area here. And then you, you know, you back, once you've harvested out, you backfill, wait for them to do the same up the other end and go again. But use a really good high quality bedding in this type of worm farm. I highly recommend it. Use like a mushroom compost or a Marty's garden compost if you live close to me. And uh, yeah, and sort of go from there and really get the good quality casting coming out of your worm farm when you're scaling up. Because this is a great way to scale up. Now you could make boxes. There could be a big box um, that you make out of timber. They will eat the timber, be careful. But different types of things. Just remember you want to keep it insulated in the shade as much as possible. <laughs> here we go here. Are you drinking worm tea? Yeah, straight out of the bottom of the worm farm. It's good stuff. <laughs> Don't forget the peeps. 
Um, we, occasionally, I think you peeps have been talking about the little dings and things on here or whatever. I, can, I forget what we mean there. But um, So what we've got, we keep moving in through into this worm farm we're looking down so we've got a good compost bedding they start chewing through that we're able to sort of start harvesting either side now down the bottom here they've got leaves at the bottom of the carbon now that is not a smart move from my point of view because what's happening is that's going to be that's breaking down under here the worms will come and eat it surely that they will but it's got to steal away nitrogen to break down right and so we really don't want to have that there that needs to be up the top on top of this area here, creating more of a forest floor style, what I'm saying on top of the, either underneath the cardboard or on top of the feeding zone. And that's where our carbon area is. So um, I think that's a bit of a mistake. Now they've got some wire screen here along the bottom. That's a really good idea. If you don't have wire screen, you could use gravel. Gravel's a bit more of a hassle when you go and get it out. Some, some type of wire screen is a really good idea. You don't really need this timber drainage frame, but it does raise it up a bit. If you've got something that you can put in down the bottom underneath, good idea. Uh, but they will come down and the worms will hang around down in here and things like that. So I just like the idea of having sort of your wire screen or something, a few layers or even just a few layers of, you know, um, shade cloth you know like a plastic shade cloth or you can use a landscaping cloth that doesn't break down and just put it a few more thick instead of one uh, you will get the odd worm go out into the bucket so what you do is you just when you're not using this you just throw this back onto the worm farm continually make this better each day and then you throw a whole lot of water harvest you what you need and then go and put it out on your garden on your veggies uh, all that type of thing so, uh, so yeah, it's, I think it works really well, this type of worm farm, and it's a really good way uh, to scale up. So let's get Scotty across. Scott King, loving the background, Marty. Good morning all. Thanks for dropping in, Scott, and uh, saying g'day. And, uh, yeah, you've been a real regular on the show, so uh, much appreciated to, um, yeah, to be here once again. And I think it looks pretty good, yeah, the background. And like Scott recommended yesterday that I um, I was talking about this background here for behind me. And we've just removed sort of like the, I've moved the computer around and got a nice clear white background to remove any distractions. I think it looks much better. So, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Scott, for, for that and inspiring me to do it. I did it this morning, set it all up and done, went out and did my microgreens deliveries and come back and started this show and getting used to using uh, this software, Ecamm Live, which thanks to all you guys through the Buy Me A Coffee link and also through Super Chats uh, made that possible for this to happen. And you can still, if you want to support Marty's Garden, you can still head over there to the Buy Me A Coffee link and become a member or buy me a coffee or even purchase the ebook, and that help, will help Marty's Garden keep going into the future. So thank you very much. Uh, for everyone that's done that uh, so far. So what we're talking about is the scaling up of worm farming and is it worth doing? Should we consider it? And um, what's the benefits of it, right? So I think if you're going to, so one of the benefits is you could actually decide that you want to start selling some worms or start selling some compost or start selling some worm castings on places like uh, Facebook Marketplace. Got to be careful. Sometimes you put the word worm in the Facebook Marketplace. I don't know why they do it, but if you put compost in there, no problem. Uh, you can uh, do it that way. And that's how I got started selling my compost was just putting the word compost instead of the word worm cast and um, it's worked for me uh, so far and I charge around about a dollar a litre if I sell the worm cast separately but generally it's blended through uh, through the compost. Hey Marty, I have five worm farms, five bath worm farms, I put nothing on the bottom, just chicken wire with insect netting over the plug with a paver to hold it and it works really well. Yeah, I think sometimes we can do overkill. I think that's a sort of a better way to go, to be honest, using less material. And you just sort of, you know, you've got it on a nice angle there. So um, thanks, Brian, uh, for, sh for sharing that. You must get a lot, you must have a lot of worms and must have a lot of compost coming out. And uh, yeah, how often are you harvesting from the five bath worm farms? I'd like to know. And 
Uh, can you let us know what also you're using as a, a bedding in there? That would be really helpful uh, for us all that have come to watch this show and to watch the reruns. Because at the moment, we've got 15 people watching, seven thumbs up, which is really great. If you haven't thumbed up already, please give us a big thumbs up. Helps with the YouTube algorithm to get shared out more to more people. And if you're watching the videos right through in the rerun as well, helps build up watch time and get these videos out because the live shows never used to do as good online and they're starting to get more popular and people are watching them more. And I really love the interaction of talking with people and getting comments like this and just helping, like not only does it help me improve because I get to practice running these live shows and talking to you guys and building community. And at the same time, um, yeah, we get these great comments of people that can share things that I don't know and that aren't doing, that I haven't done. So the collective of it all really makes this super powerful. And I've had people say to me, oh, you know what, I watched the live shows and then this, or a rerun, I watched the comment come up and it's something I would have never thought of or a question I would never ask. And then it's just, bing, wow, how cool is that? I will do that too. So they're highly educational. And uh, they are a lot of fun uh, to make as well. And they are, it's time saving for me if I'm getting better. Like if you saw yesterday's one, I didn't have this little text down under here, Marty, we're agri horticulturist. So that's been added now. And um, we might try in the future to run a little slideshow or something in behind or some videos and things uh, later on. But first, got to get one step at a time, right? Just one, you know, a couple of percent better each time and uh, we'll end up with a really, really good show. So another way to scale up uh, we could be looking at, so let's bring this up here because we, we don't need to look at the bathtub at the moment. So another way to scale up could be just buying another worm farm, right? Or picking one up secondhand somewhere. Um, but the thing is you, you probably, the, and, and that's not a bad way if you've got small space, right? If you've got a small space, uh, you could scale up with some phone boxes, different things like that, and build your own DIY farms. You know, you could get an old kitchen sink, those type of things. But what I recommend is you really sort of start looking at more surface area. And, you know, like, because I've got windrows outside and then the biggest worm farms ever, the big barrel worm farms, and I sort of scaled up that way. But if you're looking at more surface area and like a, a larger farm that doesn't fluctuate with the temperature so much, you're gonna get overall better success long time. The little farms are great. I love them, that's how I started out and I've had them for years until now. And um, yeah, they, they are great, but scaling up more surface area, more compost and less temperature fluctuation does make a big difference. And then you'll find that you, once after about three months of you scaled up that, um, you could easily then um, build like another sort of like attachment to a garden building like an underground compost sort of thing and just feed the worms into there under the mulch area and um, start planting around that like I've done uh, out on my windrows. So I'll talk about something else that's really interesting. I'll just go back to this and I'll just shrink myself down a bit to have a look at this worm farm here. Now you can see this bucket down below here, right? It's collecting um, this, this um, liquid. Now, what you can do is you can actually put underneath another long tub. Now I've done this, you put another long tub underneath. So any worm that crawls out and falls down um, and you put wood mulch and everything sort of under here, so hay and wood mulch and stuff, and you put another tub and you put another layer of another sort of worm farm, but it might only be quarter the size. Anything that falls out and runs down will go into that worm farm. And so it's a worm farm trap and it captures them and then you can grab them and move them around, put them back into other farms, do whatever you wanna do. And you really don't need much, you just need some wet compost with some way for them to, and it's a bit of leaf litter on it, and some way for them to get into there instead of like crawling onto the ground and dying. Now that might sound a bit overkill, but it's something that I've done in the past and I put it below my compost bins as well. Um, I have troughs, uh, like water troughs and things underneath and uh, it definitely works and you find after about three months you come and go, wow, I didn't realize how many um, actually escaped and got into that system uh, down below. So we'll just drag another comment across here, Scott King. Wow, interesting. I'm running the three-tier rectangular tumbleweed. 
using a variety of cardboard, cocoa peat and soil from my tumbler as bedding and it works great. Although I've never covered the hole. I think, you know, like this, yeah, getting the, the bedding from your tumbler is a really good method. Now, if you're not tumbling too much, you can actually, you'll probably find that the compost worms will climb into there after a while, Scott. Um, I've got them all through mine and my handle's broken. Um, May sent me another handle, but I, I don't have the tools and everything to change it over. And I just, to be honest, I'm just happy with it just sitting and I just do it by hand every now and again. And yeah, I get plenty of worms in there. So the bedding from a tumbler is a really good way to go because uh, you're just throwing in every time you're using the compost system, like what I've got at home, I've got a little tub, and so I'm ripping up a little bit, a little bit of toilet roll, a little bit of old tissue paper, maybe some newspaper when I bought, purchased something from the shop, and then my compost, throwing that into there, and I walk out, throw it into the tumbler, um, or into the into the worm farm. So I'm always mixing a bit of carbon uh, with the food source, sort of as I'm going before it goes out. And when I come back to the tumbler later on, I grab that out. And then I put that, I'm doing the same as you, Scott, and then putting that into the into the worm farms. And that bedding, is, that's super powered stuff, right? Because it's already got all the good bacteria and everything. The worms just stay super healthy. So Mary and I farms. On a, on a farm as a large as a bathtub, do you have to have a drain? What if you just monitor your moisture? Uh, I think it's really important to have a drain for the fact that you really want to be using... The, the the coming out you can like some people have very small farms uh, indoors and things and you monitor the moisture but they more chance of them becoming sour and if you know like these outdoor farms like this if it's raining and stuff you really want you know you sort of don't mind them flooding a little bit and then filling up and doing that it's really good for the farm good for the bacteria in there so you can do it but I just recommend that you have some way because when you've got a larger volume, you've got also water seeping out of the vegetable scraps and different things that are in the farm and it's leaching down and then it's, that leachate's got to have somewhere to go. And if it ponds somewhere in the bottom of the farm and you don't see it, it could become sour and anaerobic. So we want to keep, we always want to be thinking good oxygen. And uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Small worm farms, yes. Bigger ones, not so much. Much harder to do. Uh, Marie. Okay, so the next way to scale up in the big farms is having like just a big uh, big compost bin with a bottom cut out like what I've got uh, and just filling it two thirds full and building it pretty much the same like this but the water just flows straight down to the ground so you can then plant your plants around the bottom of it and it's like a big system that just feeds all the garden down below and that's one of the secrets for my um, really big herbs and things oh excuse me that i've got growing out on the farm on my micro farm here and as i said before i've just done uh deliveries so pick some uh basil and uh yeah because the basil leaves are so big um i don't have to harvest a lot to get a good sale so i can actually charge a little bit less and, and go more often and keep that sort of that rolling so you know that is another way to sort of scale up is just buy one of those big open compost bins and predominantly use it as a compost system but um in a way you know we want to have the worms in there feeding on it and getting on it and so i've got more tomatoes than i need at the moment some of them are falling down with the rain and they're hitting they're hitting on the compost area and the worms are coming up and biting on the on the tomatoes the ones that are on the ground there's little bites and then they start to get in there this the compost worms have tried to drill, drill into the tomato um First time I've seen that, but it's my fault for not staking up properly and just getting too much growth too fast. I just couldn't keep up with it. Um, let's bring this across here. It's uh, what Scott said here. I think not having a drain allows space to anaerobic bacteria, bacteria while on top on worms leaving the bin. I always have worms leave my plant pots, find them dead at the bottom. Reason why, how to fix it. Okay, I think not having a drain allows space. Yeah, so we've already talked about the, the drain. I always have worms leave my pot plants, find them dead at the bottom, reason why, how to fix it. Oh, they, look, the pot plants could get just too hot, you know. They're out in the sun, um, you know. 
Winter time, you'll probably find they, they do a little bit better. It could get dry uh, in there as well. And they don't, you know, I've had them survive in pot plants, but it could just be so many different reasons for them. They could just run out of food. Generally, it would be uh, that they're too dry or, or, or it gets too hot or they just can't sort of move around. But don't worry about it too much. Um, they're not really doing a lot of help in pot plants anyway. Um, it's more really the compost that you're putting into the pot when you're potting and the uh, the, the worm cast and the worm tea that you're feeding uh, your plants with. So, yeah, um, I wouldn't worry about it too much, mate. Just keep feeding it, uh, the, the pot plants, the worm tea, because they, they're not so much feeding from the, from the back beneficial bacteria in the pot um, to photosynthesize. They're using the, the nutrients that have been stored into the compost until it's virtually gone. And that's why we're always topping up with some type of uh, liquid feed, right, into the pots. So at the moment, we've been going for 30 minutes. We've got 20 people watching and 12 thumbs up. Thank you so much for coming to watch this live show. If you'd like to leave a super chat, any do small donation is extremely appreciated. We've also got the Buy Me A Coffee link down below to help Marty's Garden keep running. We've got this new software now from Ecamm Live that we purchased because of you guys. And it looks pretty nice, I think. And everyone's coming in nice and clear, good sound. And we're going to be creating, I'm going to be creating uh, all different types of content. It's not just going to be predominantly uh, large scale of sort of worm farming stuff now. We've got some little documentaries coming out. There's one coming out tomorrow about an Aussie farmer. Uh, that'll be out at 9 a.m. tomorrow. And then next week on Wednesday, we've got one on companion planting. And then I'm going to be going through and just finding different things on the web and uh, talking about them and discussing uh, what's going on. So yeah, fancy pants. I know 18 bees. It is looking fancy, I must admit, and I'm feeling pretty chuffed. But it's because of uh, everyone that's been uh, so helpful so far. And um, we it cost end up costing about 172 yeah, US, so a bit over $200 Aussie. And uh, we raised that through the Buy Me A Coffee page and through Super Chats. And so, yeah, just wonderful. And last night when I was doing the other live show about talking about this new software that we got, someone purchased an ebook for my <laughs> Starting a Worm Farm and Beginner's Guide right there and then. So that was really cool to see. And uh, it's, it's I really enjoy being here, doing these live shows and interacting at the same time. Then just, you know, always producing uh, a piece behind the camera and then bringing it out to you guys. I love that interaction and hearing what you're doing as well and getting your tips and tricks and getting the questions from you guys to really provide as much value as we can uh, to the audience and to connect to the community. So uh, thanks everyone so much so far for being here. 19 people watching, 13 thumbs up. And we're talking about scaling up your worm farms and the reason why. Now, so far we've talked about using the three tier tubs and each time we scale up, we add another tier, another tier. You really don't want to go any higher than two tiers. I think we're do, sort of doing overkill then. So the next thing is once we sort of get above that three to six months sort of stage where we're getting quite a lot of worms, we then want to, if we want to keep uh, farming our worms and extending out, the next step could be an underground worm farm or starting a big, like a bathtub worm farm, some type of tub worm farm with a lot of surface area and more compost to stop heat fluctuation and to, yeah, to just start scaling up. And there's no real rush, right? People are, I always want instant everything, gratification these days. There's no real rush. We just need to maybe get, one day we'll just get half of the worms out. And all you really got to do is just go and grab that old worm farm and just go dump and dump it in. Dump all the castings, dump the whole lot in, all that good bacteria and keep one level to yourself because you'll find that, that that'll work really well because they like that bedding that they've already been in and they're used to all that and that beneficial bacteria that's in there will start connecting to all the food and everything on there really quickly and you'll turn over much faster. So uh, that's just a bit of a pro tip for you guys when you're first starting out. Pour the half a worm farm straight into your next, uh, to your bigger one with all the worms in it. And uh, it's great to see um, people in here having a chat and saying g'day and uh, really sort of chuffs me as a, someone who's creating these things. 
Uh, maybe one day Marty's garden will have a producer and we'll have someone behind the scenes helping us with this type of stuff and helping us develop stories and create a, a really good show. But um, one step at a time, right? <laughs> First, we've got to get people watching a lot of the videos and start sort of rolling because we've been on a bit of a downhill slide. But uh, it's it's coming good and it's a lot of fun. So uh, thank you, everyone, again for being here. So the next thing we can look at, so we've talked about moving away from the little ones, maybe um, a bigger worm farm, and then having sort of like the next thing could be uh, a little permaculture underground worm farm. Now, you can use anything for those, some type of big bucket, uh, you could, I'll just get this bigger again. So we could use some type of big bucket and drill holes in the bottom, as long as we, we don't even always have to have a lid. But um, if you've got a lid, lots of holes in the top, you can use things like olive drums, you know, like those 10 gallon buckets, drill lots of holes, I've used those. Um, you can actually even go to the stage where you don't even have to have the container, you can actually just build a big compost pile and just feed in the center and have your food in the center and just wet it down, cover it with mulch, like I do with my windrow. And yeah, you've got, really, you've got a worm farm. Now, another way to do it, and I don't have the image for that, is you can build four blocks of straw bales. So you've got like a U shape, sort of like that. And you walk in, you fill that full of compost, you grow all your plants around the outside of your straw bale like that, and you're throwing your worms into the centre. And the, the, the bales start to rot down, the worms move up through into it, feeding all the plants. And at the end, when you're finished for your season, you just hoe it all back in, and you just start again. You just And you just create this ongoing loop. Uh, so yeah, it's, that's another way that you can ask. To, <laughs> that, that went. That went then. Excuse me. That's another way you can scale up uh, in the garden to do that. So if you've got any questions, guys, normally when we go into sort of half an hour, we go into uh, more of a Q and A sort of thing. And what we'll do is we will get rid of that there and bring me into the centre. Actually, let's put it over here a bit. And we can actually probably change the, the scale on this. I think we can go uh, wide, 16 by nine, and have it like that. That'll do. And then we can bring some people in. That's, a, that's the first time I've done that. So as I said, I'm learning as I go to learn how to use this, uh, this software. Scotty mentioned about getting a different background, and so it's less distracting. So here we are here. And I, I want to hear your questions. I want to hear your tips, what you're doing, how you're worm farming, or if you're using it. And are you using it any way to introduce for the garden? Because the whole thing for me is with the micro farm and for gardening is using that process. So I grow two ways now. I grow hydroponically in an air garden, which I really like. And then also we've got, oh, Lisa just bought a coffee. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Buy me a coffee. Maybe she picked up the worm farming guide. I'm not sure, but hey, that's just unreal. I said the little beat there. So yeah, two. I'm growing, you know, in compost, worm farming, and then I've got my air garden, which um, the air garden's pretty good. Predominantly, I'm still a soils guy. I love the soils, but I tell you what, I just can't beat the air garden. I just can't beat it for production and going out and harvesting as well, uh, and getting quite vo a lot of volume. Let's bring over Brian here. Actually, we're. Sorry, we need to keep back following the list down. Billy May, I'm going to get cow poo for all my bins and farms. The veggie patch needs a top up with compost, so I'll use all that and start a new compost pile or maybe two. Yeah, good idea. Just remember that the cow manure, when it's quite fresh, it's got a fair bit of nitrogen in it, so it will heat up. So you may want to sort of let it sit for a little bit. You've got a big pile of it and then just let it, a little bit of the heat come out of it and then start use that as the first pile and then feed your other pile with it slowly. So you've got sort of two, and then your, your third pile. So you're always thinking in threes when you're doing composting. So you've got your hot, your first mix, second mix where it's just starting to sort of humusy down, and your third one's going out where it's nice and cool. And the worms will be in sort of like in the second part to the third part. So you're always throwing your worms back into the second part when you're harvesting. Your first part is where it's generally pretty hot. And in winter, you use the first part where they all hang around the edges to keep warm. So um, that 
is the way to do it, Billy. And if you in winter, you can actually throw that more f fresh manure on top in that spot because that'll heat up and keep the worms uh, warmer. And another good way uh, to scale for sure using cow manure because they love that stuff. Produces a really good high-end uh, quality fertilizer as a casting. Brian Oliver, I run fish emulsion from my pond and run that through. It's crazy for the garden. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> that is great stuff. Um, it's full of good beneficial bacteria. Just amazing way to do it. And thanks for sharing that, Brian. And you could maybe run um, the water from ponds back through worm farms as well. T. Trenton, hey Marty, g'day. T. Trenton, how you going, buddy? Thanks for coming over. And he's been worm farming for over 10 years. Well, I'm sure you must love it and got knowledge to share. So please feel free to share here, um, T. Trenton. And uh, if you want to, what's your first name? We can, I can use that. But if you're happy just to use that, then let's do that. All right, Owain's Worm Farm. Hi, people. Unreal. Good to see you here from Owain's Worm Farm. And uh, welcome to the show. We've been talking about scaling up and all different ways that we can do that. Should we do it? Should we consider it? And if you've been, if you come sort of halfway through the show, you might want to go back to the beginning later and watch the reruns because I talk about the steps of how you can scale from a small one right through up to something like what we're talking here, which has got a wider surface area. And so we can stop fluctuation of heat. We can get larger volumes of worms and um, as, our, as our worm farm populations grow, we can then have lots and lots of compost worms. It just depends on how much you need it for and how much you want, right? So that's the whole reason to do that. Uh, let's have a look and we'll bring some more things across here. So we're in the Q&A time. Please share away, guys. Say good day to everyone too. And let's get some really good things rolling. I'd love to hear what you're doing. I'd love to hear any tips and tricks that you want to share here. And also any questions that you may have for me. And um, we're generally about 30 seconds behind uh, rolling these live shows. And uh, it's, this, is a, this is great. I'm really enjoying it. And people don't seem too bothered that I'm producing a piece of content every day at the moment, which is really cool. And uh, got to stay hydrated in this summertime. So Scott King, big into fish as well, Brian Oliver. Have a lot of tropical fish setups and always use water change water for plants as well as the worm tea. I think that, you know, like this is another really interesting way to scale up, I believe, is, you know, like a lot of the guys that have got these, you know, aquaponic systems, they use the worms in the aquaponic systems um, in the bedding because they used to have to have a problem with the old roots and getting the old roots out. So they'd have to remove all the stones, the clay pebbles and things. And once they introduced compost worms in the system, because it's flood and drain, flood and drain, so they're not drowning and they're living in there, they're eating the old rotten roots, they're compost worms, and then they've got no problem. They can just plant in again and it creates this much better of a cycled loop. So I think um, it can really go much further yet I don't know how you can add them together. Maybe it would be the last bit of waste water that goes out at the end would then go into the worm farms. Not real sure, but they, I'm sure someone's doing it. We just uh, don't know. And uh, I've never done anything to do with aquaponics yet. Oh, excuse me, Coca-Cola. <laughs> so um, let's get back to the right ones here. Again, lots of things coming through and I will catch up onto all of them, I'm sure. Your videos encourage me to keep going in the winter when I forget about them in the summertime. <laughs> that's cool, that's great, mate. Well, you've been going for 10 years, so uh, I'm sure you don't need too much encouragement. Billy May, I just walk around the paddocks and get nice dry ones, a nice cow manure he's talking about. I get a few wet ones, but mostly dry stuff. This is my first year doing a veggie patch and that I'm actually looking after, and I have so many veg. That is just awesome, Billy. Love that, man. Great way to grow food and create that sustainability and just, yeah, fresh food grown by yourself. That way, can't beat it. Scott King. T. Trenton, I love to hear people's top tips. 10 years, wow. Do you have one? Yeah, let's hear one. We want to hear a top tip. Any tip will do, mate. And I'm sure... 
people haven't heard them all here, even if it's something quite simple, I'd be surprised. We're getting to really scale up in the IBC tote. Hey, that's interesting. I've never done one in an IB, IBC tote. Um, my concern is, is how do you get it in and out and how do you harvest them because they're so deep. So I guess you cut it quite shallow, right? Uh, and then you, you've got quite a few sections. So maybe the second section or the middle section can become like a veggie garden or something like that. Uh, very interested to hear um, how that goes in the future. So stay tuned to the shows and uh, when you're on live, let us know uh, how that works out. You've got a lot of surface area in those and I guess you just need a little drainage hole at the bottom somehow or, or a drainage hole in each corner. I'm not sure how you do that, but um, that sounds really interesting. And it would be a good way to scale up if you were maybe working on building, um, selling these the compost and the compost worms. That could be a really good way if you can get them cheap enough. So let's, where are we going here? We've got Brian Oliver here. And today we've got 21 people watching, 15 thumbs up. If you haven't thumbs up yet, guys, please do so. It helps the YouTube algorithm. It helps to get these videos out to people. And when you're watching for a longer time, if you're not coming and going quickly, um, it shows YouTube that I'm, I've got something interesting, people that are worth watching. And so that helps this video perform much better uh, into the future. So uh, thank you for that, guys. Uh, Brian Oliver, combine it, Scott. Just see how it goes. Benefits the farm as well. Just a thought. Yeah, 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 just a th definitely. Let's go. Lisa, hello, Marty. I have tiger worms in a wicking bed. It works very well. So the wicking bed, tiger worms, and the garden together, is that right? Um, or is it like a worm farm wicking bed? Let us know a little bit more about that, Lisa. And lovely to see you here. And I always smile when I see that profile with that little dog. You've still, <laughs> still got the same one going. Awesome. Hey, Owen's oh, worm farm. Thank you very much. We have four pounds and 49, is it cents they use in the US, but from Owain's. How is everyone today? Worm farming is an interesting topic. So sharing a super chat super chat with a fellow worm farmer. Well, thank you very much. As I said at the beginning, all these little, anything from small to large, it just helps so much uh, with the production time and things for Marty's Garden to keep rolling. So truly appreciate it and what we do now because we've got the new software is we go one two three thank you and we can turn it up a bit i think that was a bit soft let's turn it up a bit and go for it a bit louder here we go one two three super chat for always word pub thank you so much i gotta remember to turn that sound effect down it can get quite loud at time, so yeah, much appreciated, unreal. So 18 bees, I use five gallon buckets and let the worm tea slow drip from bottom spigot into the soil and move the buckets around the garden. Plus I take small buckets of soil from mountains and blend to the garden. I think I remember you saying something to me before or seeing something in one of your videos about that. So you're grabbing sort of like different microbes and different stuff uh, by doing that, different beneficial bacteria and introducing it in the system. I think it's a quite a clever thing to do. And uh, yeah, and just yeah, having the five buckets and then the worm tea slowly drip from the bottom into the soil, that's a really good idea too. And I haven't never done that. And um, so, wonderful tip. Actually, let's give that one an applause. There's been some great tips, but I forgot we got the applause button, but sometimes they've got to be done. Maybe we can turn it right up and I can fade it out. I'm getting used to it. It's better now. So thank you for, uh, yeah, for being a part of the show and regularly turning up. It's just wonderful. T. Trenton, I use old pot soil from a marijuana dispensary nurseries for my worm bedding and they love it. Wow, that's really cool. So recycling uh, back through, love that concept. That is just gold um, and yeah, definitely worth an applause. But I don't wanna overkill it <laughs> the applause guys, but that's a really great tip. What I also do and many people know is I collect the uh, coffee grounds from the cafes now. We've got two cafes closed at the moment where I live. One's on holidays, the other one's for cleaning for COVID. And so the, the one of them's just getting smashed at the moment. I was down there at 9.30, 9 o'clock this morning, dropping off microgreens and herbs for my delivery. And I picked up a whole, their whole thing, their whole vat was full of coffee grounds already. 
And so I grab that and feed to my worms and throw into the compost pile to feed the biology. And um, that is free everywhere. And I can imagine if you mix that with, um, with that bedding, you would end up with a, something really, really amazing. Maybe it's maybe worth a thought if you can get the coffee grounds somewhere regularly. Uh, 19 views, 16 likes, hit the like button for Marty. Last, when I mentioned that before, someone disappeared. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I don't know why. I just like, yeah, can you just stay a bit longer? And it's like, ding, just gone. Um, so, not everyone likes me, that's for sure. Oh, well, you know, it could have just been pure coincidence, and I'm getting paranoid. Here we go. So, listening from the bat and lurking in the background. Get a LP. Nice to see you here again. And yeah, you, like I said to people before, if you're listening in the show, you can actually like listen to this show like a podcast. Put it on your big TV, put it on your computer screen somewhere and do your cleaning and listen in the background because uh, it, this show sort of runs a bit like a podcast when we're doing the live shows. And I read out all the tips and everyone's comments so you can just listen along. So I think it's a great way to go. We're just not used to doing it like that, so it doesn't always have to be visual. And uh, you can do that during the rerun as well and listen in uh, a bit like you would a podcast while you're cleaning the house. Uh, that would help with the show uh, get more views and things too. Marie, we are going to cut the 275 gallons tote in half. It has drains made in it. Yeah, right, okay, now I remember where the drain is. Yeah, good idea. Interested to see... Um, uh, where it sort of goes from there. I didn't realize that that was still sitting there. I'll move that and just bring that down in size a bit. Getting used to using this 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 software here. So we'll keep moving through. LP's got another comment up here. I now have four 18 gal tubs, a small tub and even a smaller little candy container. One tub I'm experimenting with a worm one tub I'm experimenting with a worm from my yard okay um, from my experience the worms from the yards don't do so good they've got to dive down deep they do better around um, big piles of compost and things like that so they can come up and go down predominantly earthworms aren't really a compost worm um, unless you find like a, 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 some type of red worm that's maybe somehow got into the area from a local stable or somewhere close by. Um, maybe we might have some places around by that's got compost piles and things uh, that can sort of migrate across the grass. I've seen that happen before. And um, yeah, and they can do that. But generally they, they sort of like, they come up to the surface, grab a bit of, which we figure we're doing. So they come up to the surface, grab a bit of food, a bit of carbon that's starting to break down, take it back down into the soil profile where they've got their tunnel, eat it down in there and then drop a casting. And that's how they're aerating the soil. So when you're composting around areas where you're gonna be planting later, that's a really good idea when you're scaling because the compost, the earthworms are also building the soil structure down below the composting area. And then you go and plant in that area with some of the compost and then you move to another spot. And that's what I've done on my windrow is one of the reasons why the compost worms are up top and the earthworms are down below. And it's another reason why I've got that, that, the amazing basil growing at the moment and different in the herb garden and thing just going absolutely crazy. Just takes uh, a bit of time. So we're getting some great comments here. And uh, thank you everyone for coming to, to watch the show. 21 people here, 20 thumbs up from what I can see from my end. Time for another sip. Keep hydrated. We are looking at the bathtub worm farm over here. If you're uh, coming in a bit later, we talk about that and scaling up with all different types of worm farms. So if you want to come back and watch the beginning of the show, the first 15 minutes, you'll get more of a breakdown on these type of worm farms and moving through from your smaller little worm farm to your bigger one. And uh, also, if you're just starting out and you're not really sure yet, just stick with your three-tiered worm farm and uh, and then go from there. And you can actually pick up the content over at Buy Me A Coffee. I've got the ebook over there. Or you can check in the members area here to get, to get through it fast. Or just go through all the old videos that I've got. But if you want to do it quickly and learn quickly, uh, the ebook or the members area here 
on the channel is the place to be, depending on how you like to consume content, right? So let's, what have we got here? And I'll just make sure, oh, Wayne's Worm Farm. Found some new cocoons in one of my wormeries today, even though it's midwinter here in Wales. That's pretty interesting. So maybe there must be some warm parts in there. The temperature must be right. Um, so what's the temperature of the worm farms? That's pretty interesting. Generally, you need to sort of be around that minimum 18. Maybe they're the euros that are doing that. And we've got a little celebration there from 18 bees. And Shramo, g'day Shramo. Marty, can I re-aerate my worm juice after it's gone bad or is it too late? No, I think you can turn it from back to, from, yeah, you can do it. I've done it before. As long as it's not, you know, you smell it going sour and woof. Just wolf it, you know, but if it's just gone a little bit anaerobic, yeah, sure, you can just, or what I do is if, if it's just a little bit gone, I just pour it back through my worm farm again and just collect it at the bottom, add a bit more water with it and boom, um, it doesn't affect, it seem to work. That's how I do it anyway. Just put it back through the worm farm. Okay, let's see if we can get this thing. For some reason, Scotty's disappeared out of there, gone too big. Maybe it's because it's a lot of, text there scott king marie and ni farms will work a treat if it's the ibc totes cut in half you can get aluminium braces for them too so they're a bit more sturdy i've used them for big learning or tank fish okay cool yeah uh, that's a really good tip and a really good point here uh for sure i've just got another someone else spamming here so i'm just going to ban them <laughs> and then and then you sort of come through and we'll go back to Marie again. We use a mixture of aged horse manure, compost, coffee grounds, smoking wood pellets, alfalfa meal, kelp meal, anzamite, dolomite. We don't feed any scraps. I think if you've got all that, look, I don't feed any scraps to my windrows. Uh, very rarely at the moment. The only scraps that are going into the, the, the big worm farms, the biggest worm farms ever, and maybe it's the tomatoes. So I've just got too many cherry tomatoes at the moment. Some of the bigger ones have fallen down, hit the ground because I didn't stake them up properly. So I've gone in, I've put like bits of cardboard and bits of um, plastic and whatever from lids and things underneath the tomatoes because the worms are coming up and biting them and chewing on them, believe it or not. And then they wait until it gets a little bit rotten and they move in. And this is a compost worm moving into uh, the tomatoes on the ground. So uh, just crazy to see that. But thank you for sharing that. And I think that would make a high-end quality food source for them, no doubt about that, and have all the minerals, get all the good, bac good bacteria in the whole lot. So, yeah, awesome stuff. And uh, let's go here to LP. From what I've read, these worms aren't compost worms. They're considered a type of endogeic, meaning they burrow among the top layer of soil and move horizontally more than vertically. Okay, interesting. Well, keep us in the loop, mate. That does sound very interesting uh, and good to know. And if they're, yeah, more of a sort of like a horizontal worm, uh, yeah, it's exciting, exciting stuff. Be interesting to know how much they eat too. Oh, if you know, this is what happens when you go live. <laughs> Anything like that can happen. <laughs> okay, Dalton. And boy, g'day, welcome to the show. I don't know if you've been watching off and on for a while, but nice to hear from you. Uh, my wife's sister works at a coffee shop and I have access to loads of coffee grounds. I don't want to add too much to my farm at once. Any advice to a good amount? Uh, just a small worm farm, the tiered ones, you know, just one handful waiting, sprinkle it right across and then wait till it's nearly gone and add a little bit more. You've got to have dolomite as well if you're doing it in the smaller worm farms to stop the acidity. So uh, I would recommend if you've got quite a lot of it, start having a compost tumbler or a compost pile, throw it into some type of carbon source. So some, maybe some wood chip, leaf mold, things like that, turning that over and then feeding that back into your worm farms and turn it over. And that's something similar to what I do uh, here at the Marty's Garden Micro Farm. T Trenton, if you want them to breed quickly, turn up the heat in the winter time. Yeah, turn up the heat. Definitely, and you can do that just by adding more nitrogen into a carbon source. Uh, as long as you've got a good square meter or three square meters, or sometimes you don't even need that much if you've got a lot of uh, nitrogen, but just be a bit careful with that. Oh, I've got this itchy nose going, <laughs> going on. Okay, so let's go across here and Scotty King. That's my car partner, Gabby Marty. She's always here with me, joined at the hip. Oh, hey, Gabby. 
Uh, nice to, yeah, welcome. Welcome, I can see you uh, in the photo there. So that's great, nice to meet you. And thanks for sharing that. I love to meet new people and hear what's going on. LP, they're called Octolasion worms. Octo, so octo is something to do with eight, right? So what's that? Maybe that's eight segments in them. They feed on soil and organic matter. That said, I shared with four, and now I have over 50. I need to look close to make sure it's not another type of worm. Yeah, very interesting stuff. Um, Octolasian, never heard of him. Anyone else heard of him? Let us know in the comments box down below. It'd be interesting to see if he's gone from four to 50 because he's gonna go from 50 to 250 pretty quickly now um, if they are the Octolasians that are breeding on. Owain's Worm Farm. I've got Euros in my wormery. Outside temperature are roughly 10 degrees Celsius during the day and minus two at night, but I keep all my wormeries in my shed. I think, well, the you know, like I'm not a huge, I have uh, Euros, but they perform mostly better in the winter here and then my Africans do better uh, in the summer. But yeah, it's, they, pro they sound like they're doing quite well, so that's really cool. And uh, there's, you know, I don't think there's enough information about Europeans and African night crawlers out there. I think it's everything sharing and sharing the same stuff. And that's why it's good when we have these shows and things because you people that are doing this are then sharing the import into this and creating new content that other people haven't heard. So that's the brilliant thing about these live shows. And now that we've actually been able to sort of just, you know, get things looking really nice as well, um, hopefully, you know, that's looking good enough <laughs> as I drag these across. Uh, who knows, I need to get that colour scheme right sort of in the background there uh, to make it look a bit nicer. We'll just drag those those corners in and uh, bring that in behind and then drive it up a bit. And there, look, that looks pretty nice at the moment. And so we will keep on rolling on. What have we got here? Scott uh, Scott King, it's the ones with the aluminium frames. I get them free from work. Wow, that's that's really cool to get them free. Uh, they cost 100 bucks here in Australia each now. They used to be free, and then everyone realised you could charge money for them. And now it's like a little business selling these things. If it's really them who have multiplied, then something is working with them in the bin. Definitely, definitely. So you just need to make sure that you can actually identify them each time. I'm not a big fan on identifying compost worms. I find it a bit tedious myself. I like the tigers because... <laughs> Got little yellow tail, he just got, yep, that's a tiger. <laughs> Scott King, Marie and NO Farms, yeah, perfect for those, the good ones. And for free, that's great. Cost an arm and a leg, and a leg a second hand over here in Australia. Yeah, I know, when they used to be free, right? Until everyone sort of cottoned onto it. A bit like shipping containers, I guess, too. Used to be free once upon a time, they couldn't get rid of them. Um, then people get clever and turn them into money. I totally love nerding out on the topic of worms. Well, we will be running a show, you know, uh, consistently over the time, you know, and sporadically. I'm not really good at these exact times because, you know, so many things going on all the time. So you just got to keep an eye at the moment for when I come out and boom, I'm here. And if you can be here, be here. If you can't, you can't. But yeah, we can nerd out on uh, the topic of compost worms. Uh, hopefully once a week or once a fortnight for the moment why I'm um, off from my break from my school job over the school holidays. LP, Octolasian is the genus, but there are multiple species. I'm not sure what species they are, but I believe the more common one name is grey worm. They're much more pale than a compost worm. Okay, interesting, interesting. So you need to find out... LP, I ain't gonna be doing that. <laughs> Just like too much work to me, but I am interested, and uh, yeah, and I'm sure everyone else uh, is as well about what sort of coming and how they're going, how well they're going to go. What I'm interested in is, are they the same worm, and are they breeding, and if they are, how are we going to scale? In this video is we're talking about scale, so uh, it's pretty interesting. We use the Euros in one setup and Red Wigglers in another. We like the Euros, they seem to make better castings. I find that the, um, yeah, I, I actually find the African Tigers 
I mean, the African Nightcrawlers make a better casting for me as well. But because I've got predominantly so many different varieties and, and everything's sort of all mixed together, I just can't keep them separate. It's just too hard uh, to do that. But uh, I, I get what you're saying. It's a sort of like a bigger, fluffier casting as well that come out of uh, the Nightcrawler. And we will just remove this turkey from here. They're coming in with their bots. I don't know what vor.ong is. <laughs> doesn't even make sense. Well, they're botanists with stuff that doesn't even make sense. LP. I sp spent quite a bit of time trying to identify these and still aren't certain. They could be a good addition to my raised beds. If they're not compost worms but do eat organic matter, they move stuff. Look, 100%, I would be... Keeping some, like, if, if I was going to worm nerd out on this, I'd have some, like, in a worm farm. Um, then if they were starting to scale up a bit, I'd move some to an underground worm farm section. But I'd be keeping the other ones separate so I could identify them to get an idea what they are before I moved to scale. And then I'd be doing some type of permaculture worm farm around the garden where I'm growing my plants because then, you you know... We want to use the worms to improve the soil, improve the good bacteria, and for them to do their job to help plants grow, right? And as a feed source for other animals and different things. And just, you know, in that, you know, like we've got the earthworm and then we've got the top worms, the compost worms. And that system, you know, like they're only one in billions of things that are working in the soil. But it seems when you take them away, everything else seems to not do as good. So they definitely play a big role in that whole system overall. And it definitely keep me posted. So yeah, thanks for that LP. I do appreciate it. And it have spurred interest in us all. Now we've got 23 people watching, 22 thumbs up. If you haven't thumbed up already, please give us a big thumbs up. We generally like to keep the number above the people viewing to what, because people are coming and going. It helps with the algorithm and it shows that people are enjoying the show. So if you're enjoying the show, please do so. Um, always happy to get more thumbs up and uh, to, yeah, just to keep rolling with you guys and keep things going. And you've been really interactive today, I must say. I'm having a bit of trouble keeping up with you guys, but just keep rolling them out like we are now, producing a great show, and I'm sure people will really enjoy this content that's coming out from you that are here today. Uh, Marie, be mindful if you use the bedding recipe we use. It heats up at 90 degrees Fahrenheit after 24 hours. After about three days, it cools down, then we add the worms. Yeah, so really good tip there because you can actually, if you add them too quick, you could kill your worms, no doubt about that, and cook cocoons. So that's why I was saying before, have your three stages, your hot, your medium where things are cooling down, then your cold at the end, and work on a three-way cycle. Uh, and that way you always get the best results. And then you, as you're grabbing the worms from the last harvest, which is the cool cycle, you're moving them back into the middle, not into the hot pile, right? So a uh, good way to do it. So thank you for sharing that, Marie. That's a, a really good point. And uh, a good recipe too, uh, as well. So if you missed that recipe, you might need to go back about 10 minutes uh, to look into that. And so we're getting some thumbs up. People are remembering to thumbs up. We got, oh, we're right on 24 people watching and 24 thumbs up. So what I'm going to do, I've got a, I've got a DJ air horn here. It's really loud. So maybe we'll do the triangle. That's not the DJ. The, sorry, I've got to do, I've got to do the applause. We'll just turn it up. We'll fade it out and boom, that's yeah. 24 people watching, 24 thumbs up. And uh, it's been a great show so far. And we're looking at different ways we can scale up Marty's garden. And see that? I just played with that a little bit. And, oh, loving this software. And Scotty mentioned about changing the background a bit. But it's gone a bit white, I sort of, <laughs> sort of feel. Um, so we might move this back down and have a quick look again at this. Oh, we were at the bath bathtub worm farm. We'll just bring this back around. Try and keep the nice bit of a blacky background in the back there, keep it looking really cool. And we'll just go on to James says here, hey Marty, nice to see you live again, been watching the reruns. Thanks for watching the reruns, mate. Hopefully people enjoy them, they get some value out of them. And like the comments that have been rolling out today and the tips and tricks from people and the questions have been really awesome. Um, I've been learning stuff too and I just 
just makes it so, bring so much value. At the moment, I'm not working at the school. Uh, I've got a little bit of part-time work and somewhere else for a disabled gardener and then also selling my compost, which I'm sort of semi-closed at the moment, just doing the runs uh, for the microgreens and the herbs to a couple of the cafes around here. So it gives me more time to practice on this software that we purchased from you guys, uh, supplying Super Chats and, go and buy, and the buy me a coffee and purchasing the um, ebook Starting a Worm Farm, a Beginner's Guide, which is on the Buy Me a Coffee website for nine bucks and a good value. And uh, people seem to like that, that ebook, yeah. So thank you for everyone that's purchased and become a member over at Buy Me a Coffee and, or Bought Me a Coffee or done a super chat. Um, you've, you've made this happen and uh, I'm su super grateful for it. It gives me the opportunity to make more content and run more interactive live shows like this of a higher quality. Any tips for controlling fungus gnats? I'm using Buavira Bussiana titanase and nematodes already. Mm. Don't know. If anyone could sort of help with that, um, I've never really dealt much with fungus gnats. Um, not sure. Generally, fungus is like a humidity thing, and whenever I get fungal problems, I just bin it, but I don't know about in worm farms. Sorry, I can't help with that, but maybe someone else here may have um, some way to help you. Pinball Wizard, we've got a cool emoji and a peace sign there. Thanks, mate. Always nice to see your live shows, Marty, and I also love your other content too. Well, thank you very much. Hopefully you enjoy the um, tomorrow. We've got the this, this show coming out, the little mini doc where I'm down up at Port Macquarie filming out on uh, the chicken caravan farm out there. And uh, yeah, we go around the farm and I do a bit of an interview with uh, the owner there, Daniel. And so hopefully you'll enjoy that uh, tomorrow. Thank you very much. Neem oil for gnats. See, there you go. I told you someone would have some type of answer. So hopefully that's a solution for you there, green man. And um, if you haven't tried that already, let us know uh, if you have tried that already and we can look at uh, all the other options. So if you're coming in late, we're talking about we're talking about scaling up uh, your worm farm. So we've got here a larger worm farm. This is the um, bathtub worm farm, and it's a way to scale up from going from your small worm farm once you, you feel quite comfortable with that, and moving into a more space, more surface area, more volume, so you don't have fluctuation of heat, and you can actually start tripling your amount of uh, output that's coming through. Um, and then sort of moving through. So if you've missed all that, go back through and check later on on the rerun or go back through into the rerun now. Um, and if you want to support anything that's going on here at Marty's Garden, there's a buy me a coffee link there. You can go over and get the ebook or become a member is really the ultimate thing where you could just do a little monthly thing, your choice. And that shows me each month what we can do uh, to keep this, this show going. Because I do have some other ideas on how we can make it better, but uh, we just at the moment, just one step at a time. And it's because of you guys that made this happen um, that we can actually sort of produce a better looking show now. Uh, we've got Scott King, fungus gnats equal humidity and too much water in soil. They lay eggs and come up through. They can lay a fine gravel, you can, layer on top to stop the babies coming through okay that's a really good that's a really good tip i really like that prefer that method more than somehow going in and using a poison such as neem's okay but anything that you can do to change things without having to create any more poisons even if it's a natural one or not that's more what i'm into so i think um the humidity definitely is a big thing that was in my mind when i was thinking about the about it but I just didn't want to give an answer without having to deal with it myself. So thank you so much, Scott, for uh, sharing that. We've got 20 people watching, 27 thumbs up, and I've got a funny feeling that we'll go into sort of a record time today. We generally do between 15 to 17 people watching at one time on, on any video that I make, and then about 105 by the end of the hour and a half to 120. So we may end up doing pretty good today. Um, yeah, and people are obviously hanging around because the new productions are coming up. So, yeah, hats off to you guys for uh, helping me out with that. And look, all you guys have got great information here for um, for our friend that was asking this question. Fungus gnats use vinegar, dish soap, 
water DIY tap. Well, there you go. There's another way to do it. So you've got three options now. There's always more than one way to skin a cat, right? That's what they say. So we've got, we think, actually, sometimes when I touch this and I touch the mouse, it does, um, it does a bit of weird stuff going on. So that's not always me doing that, but uh, it is very touchy. <laughs> <laughs> but we're working with it. 19 people watching now, 27 thumbs up. And people are like coming and going uh, for a day like today. Remember, we've got the doco coming out tomorrow. Let's keep an eye out for that. And then next week, I've got the companion planning video coming out. And if you're in organics and working out pest control, don't miss that video. It's There's some new information there that maybe you haven't uh, heard before and how plants interact with each other to actually spread yeah, it's, there's a more science behind it. I don't want to give away too much there. Cheers. I'll try to reduce moisture level in the tubs. I think that's probably the way to go. I would also look at maybe adding some more carbon on top. And like I said, like Scott was saying, blocking them from coming up. If they can't get to the service surface, maybe that uh, is a good way to go. So if you've got any more questions, you've got something you'd like to add, some way that you're, um, you're yourself are actually using your worm farming, how you're scaling up. Have you uh, scaled up in the past and maybe you scaled down? Have you ever let your worm farm go and then freaked out and found a way to bring things up quickly to scale it up? Because that happens a lot, right? And it's happened to me in the past where I've gotten ill for a while and I couldn't really take care of everything. So my stocks went down. But because you only had some already, and you've done it before, you can build up the scale more quickly and efficiently and have uh, these volumes up before you know it. So I think, um, you know, the different ways to scale up, as I was saying before, bathtub worm farms, any type of big, large surface area, you can get more bedding where you're feeding at one end and then you let the worms all feed down one end and then you go down and feed up the other end. Now, I was looking, when I was speaking to a few different worm farming companies, I was looking at creating my own type of worm farm. Now, the people that have come this far, this is interesting because I haven't really shared this online before, but this may be a worm farm that someone may, may make, and it could be something that people could use into the future. So if you imagine like a pool table, right? So it's like any size from small to large, a pool table, nice and flat with the edges around, a bit deeper than a pool table, and at the end, there's sort of one hole, and it sort of like levels, so it's, it's at a 45 degree level, so I just get it down here, and so it's falling like, hang on, it's really weird doing it on the camera, so it's falling just slightly, and so at one end, uh, it's falling down, the water's, water's falling down, the moisture's coming out, and you've got a lot of surface area, you've got your towels and blankets and things on top, whatever, you can have some type of sliding lid that goes across maybe that's like a pencil case, and then what you're doing is actually when you so you're feeding at one end and then swapping in, so you can actually like just get some type of bit of timber and scrape it down in, and then you open the end of the say the pool table up like it's the shape of the pool so you open it up the end you just scrape it into a bucket, right? And fill it up again, and then just go down like that, and you have like a big squeegee that runs down into a bucket like that, just along the table down thing, got a lid. And a lot of surface area because you get more castings and more worms when you got more surface area. So if someone wants to build something like that, go for it. That's what I was going to design, share to the worm farmers. I was going to like go, hey, this is a Marty's Garden uh, style uh, worm farm that you can make, put on a tabletop or something like that. You could use lots of different things to make it. So I'd love to hear if someone wants to make something like that. And you can let me know in the future if you've done it. Maybe a few guys, you can have a go at it see how it works but i think it would work really good just remember you want to keep more volume to stop fluctuation of temperature if you're in an area that gets really hot and cold uh, other than that it would just be like your little summer worm farm that you would do like that uh, just for a bit of fun but worth thinking about and something that i was going to start working on the design with but because no one really was interested in doing anything um, it never went forward. There just mustn't be enough money in it or the whole COVID thing or whatever. But um, I think it's a good design and would work quite well. Okay, where are we up to here? 
<laughs> good luck. <laughs> yeah, they definitely the deal. Yeah, they could be a bit of a pain, I'm sure. Like I said, I haven't had them before. I don't think in, in large volumes to worry about. I grow mushrooms too, so the devil devils get crazy when they get a foothold. <laughs> Canada's Culture Australia, buddy! Good to see you doing lives. Thanks for being here, mate. And, uh, yeah, it's just been, it's, it's been really exciting getting these things rolling again and using the purchase from you guys helping out from the Super Chats, buying the ebook over at Buy Me A Coffee. Buy Me A Coffee. Some of you have become members. We've got two members in there so far. But please consider becoming a member over at Buy Me A Coffee. We don't have a Patreon page, and that would really help uh, keep the Marty's Garden Show rolling. So, yeah, awesome to be here. Thank you so much, uh, Cannabis Culture Australia, for turning up. Our plans for our worm farm is the medical marijuana industry. It's legal in our state. Our focus is the home grower, which is also legal. I think that's a really good way to go. And uh, if I was in the States, I'd be doing exactly the same thing. Uh, I, I would be taking my, 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 my knowledge to that industry and be looking and probably be more, do more consulting. And I would have like a micro farm system where we're doing running trials and things like that and get people coming in and then have some type of output, like a really high end. I wouldn't be going mid range. I'd be going to super high end casting and charge top dollar for it. Best I could. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Why not? Um, why not I say? Um, so that's really great to hear, uh, Marie. And, um, I shared your stream, Marty. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that's just absolutely brilliant. We've been going for one hour and 21 minutes. I very rarely go past one hour these days, but um, it's been such a good show and been so interactive and uh, lots of people here watching and we've got 29 thumbs up over our 26 people watching. So we're over in advance on that. So I'm going to give an applause for that and uh, we turn it up a little bit. And it's just, just awesome. That's my fake little crowd there. Thanks, guys, for the thumbs up. Uh, really cool. And, uh, yeah, let's keep rolling. Scotty. Oh, there's money in it. Everyone's interested in composting and making the world better. But no one wants to leave the kitchen. A design that looks good sits on the bench and doesn't smell like unlike maize. Yeah. I think, you know, um, I've mentioned this quite a few times. There is money, but... I don't know if anyone wants to invest in it at the moment because it's not an upward trend or whatever. It's just a flat plateau. Um, but, you know, we're here. We're interested. We're enthusiasts, and we can see the results from it. I think where the money really is going is into the medical marijuana industry, and eventually uh, it will happen here in Australia. We're just, you know, 10 years behind everything. Um, so interesting to see uh, where it goes from there. But you know, like I sell a bit of compost out of my place and it's the worms and the, and that go through the system that make it really great and no one can get it anywhere else. Occasionally it's not as good as what it should be. I, so I, I do keep moving it through, but um, there's other times where it's just absolutely brilliant and I could be getting triple the price for it, but I just keep it at that, at that one rate of $12 for a 30 liter bag. And um, people return and good word of mouth, I very rarely have to advertise and uh, I actually enjoy it when I'm not advertised because it's hard work and I don't want to do it all the time. <laughs> LP, got to get back to stuff around the house, house, but I'll keep listening. Thanks for going live and chatting, Marty. Have a great week. Thanks, LP, for turning up. Yeah, just turn up the volume, walk around the house, do what you need to do and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the show. And thanks for popping in. Much appreciated. Cannabis Cultures Australia Interactive uh, is the way to go. Uh, yeah, I really believe so too. Um, it's just interesting to see how well these videos perform on uh, YouTube. And it does help, you know, like when I get a few super chats and it's, you know, people are watching, they go over and cross and, you know, like they hear about my ebook and the membership things and things like that. So all that little bit, it just, you know, it helps turn over. And I get to chat with you guys and we get to learn and share. And it's just amazing. And um, some people forget that this I do run this as a business and they get a little bit upset when I ask <laughs> things like that. But hey, no worries. Oh, there's a trend there, just no numbers on it. If only I could invest, <laughs> yeah. Never know what you may meet, I always say. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, look, it's, it's, it's coming. I think the technology just needs to just keep rolling with it as well. And um, the, the time will come. Uh, just when you look in Google Trends, 
that's the only way place I can get the information other than knowing when you've got something running like this of how many people are actually interested uh, in this type of content um, around the globe. And like I said, some people like LP said when he came in before, he goes, I just love worm nerding out <laughs> on uh, in this live shows like this. Brian Oliver, if worm farming went super global, imagine how many synthetic fertilizers would be sitting on the shelf. Corporates would not like that at all. So I think that's a really good point. That's almost a whole nother video in itself. I'm happy to actually take the conversation while we're still rolling that uh, at the moment in that direction because at the moment there's, um, there's a urea sort shortage coming out. We get our urea out of, and they need this to make fertilizers, right? And they need it to make diesel oil, I believe, for engines. And it mostly comes out of China at the moment. And Australia, we don't have our own urea production, which is just absolutely crazy, right? Like, I don't know what happened with these politicians in the future. You know, the globalisation of allowing everyone to have so much control over what we have. And um, if we had more control over that industry, then there would be more chance of uh, the organics industry having a stronger foothold. Um, because there would be this balance here because we weren't buying all this super cheap urea out of China, which we can't get hold of uh, anymore at the moment. So it's a very interesting topic. And I believe that um, synthetic fertilizers uh, may become a little bit more expensive with uh, urea not getting out from, uh, from China, right? So interesting times ahead. And uh, be good if it sort of moves in a bit of a push to head more towards organics because these inorganic fertilizers that are hitting the soils are not good for our soils. They need to be above the ground in hydroponic units that are not being then flushed out into rivers and creeks and things um, and used that way to create sustainable loops and then they work really well. And so, yeah, really great point, um, uh, Brian, for sure. And we will just ban this dude here. Um, ban Gerald Underwood. <laughs> Don't they come up with these names? Vinu.f.y. It doesn't even tell you what it is. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But thank goodness we can. I've got this section where I can just sort of ban them. All right. So, been really good, really great show so far. Twenty-four people watching. Thirty thumbs up. We are on one hour and twenty-seven minutes. And like the, the information that's coming through today about scaling up um, the worm farms from a small worm farm right up to uh, bigger units. People have talked about they're using the U, UPC, UP, what are they called again? <laughs> those big drum vats thing they do the fish and stuff in, using those. And some great tips and tricks coming out from everyone uh, sharing here on the show. It's just been absolutely brilliant. So um, normally we don't go much longer than an hour. So I think an hour and a half is quite good. And look, if you're coming in and watching the reruns, make sure you leave some comments uh, down below. If we've got any other things coming through, please uh, throw out a question before we go. We've got about 30 seconds before I turn on the music. And um, generally, I'm about 30 seconds behind here. We've got 24 people watching, 30 thumbs up. And it's been a great show so far. And just super stoked that uh, everyone has been able to come. Pinball Wizard, Marty, I'm pretty new at growing my worms. Have you fed worms seaweed? If so, any extra benefits or is it safer to just mulch? Now, actually, seaweed, if you wash the salts out of it, it's got a lot of good minerals. The minerals are washed off the land, collected by the seaweed, and that's why they farm seaweed because it's got a lot of the minerals that are not in the soils anymore because it all went into the ocean over time, and the seaweed has been the one that's filtrates it and connects it up. So, um, yeah, wash the salt water off it. And you can, it does can get a bit smelly, but you can use it as a mulch or you can over the top or you put it through your compost, through a hot compost, and you'll get the benefits from it. I'm sure there's other people on the show here that have used seaweed before, and um, I think it's a good way to go. Just some places around the globe, you're not allowed to collect seaweed, so be careful of that. Um, you shouldn't be taking seaweed away from places where it's needed into the ecosystem, but if you, there's plenty of it and it's not affecting anything or anywhere, then yeah, uh, go for it. I think it's a good way to go. I know some people down in Tasmania collect it and put it on their gardens. It's everywhere down there and they're allowed to collect a certain amount uh, yearly, I believe. So I highly recommend it. Right, so let's put on some tunes now. 
what we'll do is everyone start saying goodbye to each other in here. Hang on, we got one more comment. Just we'll just turn this down a bit. Because I said we had a 30 second delay there. So um, if I was to buy one product today at Bunnings for My Worms, what would you recommend? Dolomite. Just to keep down the acidity and add the minerals and add a bit of add a bit of grit to uh, the system because the worms need the grit in their gut. Or if they had some type of seashell or something like a um, an oyster shell or something like that, that's what I would get. And um, there's not really much else that I would recommend out of there. The other one would be a rock mineral, if you can get a cheap rock mineral, not too expensive. Don't expect them to come and eat the rock minerals, though, and just to disappear, because I've had people say, oh, man, the rock minerals, they're not eating it. Like They don't eat it. It like, takes ages to dissipate. It slowly um, adds nutrition and minerals to the system gives them a bit of grit. So that's something that I would do. Anyway, listen, I'm busting to do a wee. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's, let's uh, get the music on. Been running for an hour and a half here now. And uh, I think I've got the sound effects right for my going over the top. And let's get the song going. Say goodbye to each other in here. I'll drag them across, guys. And uh, who knows, we may be back for another live show soon. Keep an eye open for on the screen, on your tablet or wherever you see Marty's Garden pop up. And uh, we just may be here yet again. Uh, thank you so much for the super chat. Unreal stuff. Really stoked to have something like that. And uh, yeah, heart goes out to you. Thank you very much. Happy New Year. We'll be here before New Year again. We need them. Thank you so much for coming to the show. I truly appreciate you. I'm super grateful for anyone that comes and just watches and plays a part of it. It's just like, I don't know, it's a heartfelt day today. And I just, I'm buzzing from this. And I thank you so much, everyone, for being here and your support. Keep an eye out because I'm sporadically running live shows out here and there through the day into the night, all different times. And uh, just in, in between that, enjoying the holidays in between some little jobs. You have a great day. Happy worm farming. Happy gardening. And we'll see you at the next video slash vlog live show real soon. Remember, there's a, there's a show tomorrow, Wednesday, the documentary. Don't miss it, guys. And please share it with others to get that one out. So they're a bit harder, those ones, to do. Bye for now.